Good evening, everyone. Welcome to the ninth edition of TEDx at MIMS Bangalore. I, Kinjal Gandhi, and my friend Ritik Bhatta will be your hosts for the evening. Hope everyone is doing well. Last year's TEDx, being the first virtual event, broke all the barriers posed by the pandemic. And here we are again, with more enthusiasm and much excitement to make this year's TEDx a greater success. Hence, amongst the virtual normalcy, we at NMIMS Bangalore are here to give you the exhilarating TED experience. Keeping in mind the restraints of online mode, we request you all to follow some virtual hygiene. Keep yourselves on mute throughout the evening. Keep your videos off to ensure maximum bandwidth and smooth connection. Keep your phones on silent at all times. TEDx is a global community that welcomes people from all walks of life and cultures who want to learn more about the world. TEDx is a firm believer in the power of ideas to transform people's mind, lives, and the world. TEDx mission is to bring together brilliant thinkers to present thought-provoking talks that promote learning, inspiration, and awe. Now, we'd like to share a short video on TEDx. Welcome to something special. Welcome to TEDx. This TEDx event is part of a global conversation that takes place every day in every corner of the world. In schools, in theaters, in workplaces, even in prisons, people gather to hear the best ideas bubbling up in their communities. More than 3,000 TEDx events are held every year in 170 countries. It's a remarkable thing. TEDx events are self-organized under a license from TED, a nonprofit organization devoted to discovering and sharing powerful ideas in the form of TED Talks. It's not TED itself, but your local TEDx team of volunteers that has done all the work to put on today's event, including booking all of the speakers. It's this team's ideas, dedication, and time that have made this possible. We really hope today's program sparks an exciting conversation. This is a day for curiosity and for skepticism, for inspiration and for action. The more you enter into it, the more you will take out. And now, on with the show. This edition of TEDx and MIMS Bangalore is centered around the theme of minuscule yet monumental. The theme explores different dimensions of life. It revolves around how little movements, gestures, policies, and changes can have a significant impact on the bigger picture. These components can be monumental for an individual, a business, and the society at large. Small contributions to society lead to instrumental changes. Gestures like a smile, giving a helping hand, a compliment can make someone stay and change their perspective towards life. The theme also aims at discovering what builds everything. Now we'd like to share a short video on our theme, minuscule yet monumental. We have with us the director of NMIMS Bangalore, Dr. Rajendra Nargunkar. Dr. Nargunkar is an alum of IAM Bangalore 
and has a PhD from Clemson University, United States. He has around three decades of rich experience in teaching, research, training, and academic leadership. In his stellar career, he has successfully taken up leadership roles of director with the esteemed institutes. Dr. Nardunkar has several publications, textbooks, and has published an autobiography by the name Experiments with Half-Truths. We would like to invite Mr. Rajendra to grace the event by symbolically lighting the diya and sharing a few words. The remote control has been given to you, sir. Please click on the screen to light up the diya. Thank you so much, sir. Now, let's begin with the first speaker of the evening, Mr. Akshat Srivastava. Mr. Srivastava is a former public policy consultant with the government of India, specializing in strategy and management. He is the co-founder of an edtech startup, Cases Over Coffee, which helps students in acquiring the necessary skills to progress in their professional fields. His students have landed at the world's top school, such as Harvard, Stanford, Wharton, MIT, Columbia, and the likes. He will be speaking about how small steps can help you create enormous wealth. We now invite you to deliver your talk. Okay, yeah, all right. Thank you. I was trying to unmute myself, but could not. So I was just trying to figure out the specifics. First and foremost, thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate the opportunity. I will try to keep my talk relevant to the point and actionable. Just a very quick introduction about me in addition to what has been said. So many of you might know me from YouTube. I'm a finance YouTuber. I speak a lot about investing properly, uh, investing in different asset classes, growing your wealth, one of the key challenges that we usually face, especially when we have recently started earning or if we are in college is that the entire investing space becomes really problematic for us, right? That we would not know where to start. Should we go and invest in mutual funds? Should we go and purchase some stocks? Should we go and invest in cryptocurrencies? So it's a, it's a very complex space and the entire investing thought process, it overwhelms us. So through this talk, what I would like to illustrate, there are two broad areas that I would want to talk about. One is that there are some key lessons that I've learned along the way in terms of the type of professions that I've pursued in my life. I will talk briefly about it through stories. And then subsequently, I will relate it to the investment philosophy and some steps that you can take, the small steps that you can take in terms of executing and generating results for yourself. So that's the broad agenda. And let me start my story by talking about my one and a half year old son, Zane. You might have just heard him cry. So he's one and a half year old. And one of the key things that I'm trying to sort of push him towards would be that I would want him to develop good habits, right? Why is that? Because every parent want their son or daughter to pick up good habits. And that is something that all of us stress on our kids, right? From a very young age, right? Now, if we take a step back and try to imagine that, hey, what do habits do? So habits essentially are systems or processes that allow you to achieve certain things in a more rigid structure, right? Mouthful, but let me try to illustrate these points by narrating a few key stories from my life. So the first story starts when I was around 10 years old and I started my career. So that was when I started my career. So what was I doing? So I was 
essentially a sportsman and i used to play cricket professionally so i was playing for under 14 madhya pradesh cricket teams so that is the state to which i belong and why do i call it a profession because i was getting paid to do it right so i started my career at so i started training when i was 10 and by the time i was 13 i was playing cricket semi professionally at a state level now uh, what is the system that i developed right because as a 13 year old kid most of us would be spending time at a school right so we would be spending a lot of time in schools probably coachings and if you are playing professional sport at that stage so it meant that hey every day i had to practice at least 4 to 5 hours on the field in the morning in the evening and that also meant that i was left with very little time to actually go and do the traditional type of stuff that kids my age were doing be it completing your homework on time or be it being a part of the classroom system so i used to miss like half my school year because of that so what was i doing right so i mean uh, it was important for me because of course like my parents would get really worried that you know what if you keep on playing cricket you are probably going to miss the entire schooling system and probably you would end up being a really bad student right on the flip side i really wanted to play cricket so what was the system right so the system now in the hindsight i can think and call that system as 8020 8020 rule and that was the habit or system or the small step that i took now 8020 so i have worked in consulting i have worked with major uh, management consulting firms uh so that system at major ma- major consulting firms like bcg bain mckinsey it is called as 8020 rule and the 8020 rule simply says that in order to generate 80% of the results you need to put in only 20% of the efforts right so 80% results can be generated just by 20% efforts and that is what you should focus on and that is precisely what i did ended up doing in the hindsight as a kid when i was a cricketer that i used to have a system that hey, get up at 6 study for 2 hours go to school come back play cricket all day right so i just used to get those 2 hours to study and i tried my level best to compile everything and study more effectively in that system this brings me to another sort of related point many of you might have heard elon musk giving this quote and i'm paraphrasing so he literally says that hey if you give yourself 6 days to clean your house your house will get clean in 6 days similarly if you give yourself 6 hours to clean the house your house will again get clean in 6 hours so it really comes down to having that 80 20 principle where you are giving yourself timelines where you are just focusing on the most important 20% of the things to generate 80% efforts and my first story concludes from that point that in order for me to balance both these things out being a okay student plus being a professional cricketer growing up i had to balance this and the system that allowed me to cultivate was 80 20 principle which brings me to the second story so unfortunately i could not make it as a cricketer and i had an acl bunch of different different things but subsequently i moved on to college right did interesting things and uh, right after college my first first a uh, traditional job was with a non profit organization and i was teaching underprivileged kids english right so i was teaching and i was uh, essentially going across different communities and i was working with a education focus non profit organization it was a very small organization now uh, i was like in the real world and again my parents started worrying that hey you're working with a non profit you're making a salary of 10000 inr not a very good salary and what would you do right you are very worried for your future by that time i had already written gmat i had a 770 on the gmat like good score so what i did was so i started developing a system of which now i can call it parallel income streams right so the system was very simple that hey i am doing my core non profit work i am making 10000 rupees and on the sidelines because i had a 770 gmat score i started a private gmat coaching online system right so that was a parallel income stream every month i used to get like one client and i uh, i used to make 50 60000 rupees from it so if i combine both the salaries i was getting to pursue my passion which was non profit combined it with a parallel income stream that i had built that gave me like 60 70000 parent parents happy i am happy system was working great awesome then i went to ncr business school right and then along the way i did like a bunch of other different work uh, but i always kept at the fact that hey i need to sort of create parallel income streams that's the system that i started believing 
once i graduated from ncrt i ended up working with a major consulting firm in singapore I was making great money a lot of good good things but like it happens with many of us that when we get working in a corporate job what is the primary thing that we struggle with we struggle with time right so that was the primary thing that even i was struggling at that yes money is great everything is great life is great but the issue is that i'm not getting any time that made me realize that in order to be happy in life you need to be both money rich and time rich right so i started reading about passive income streams that hey how can you make money while you sleep what are some of the key ideas things that you can execute that can allow you to be time rich and money rich both right so that was that was the game plan that was the system to which i was trying to move so along along with doing my management consulting job i started exploring multiple ideas for example i started uh developing a platform called as cases over coffee now cases over coffee is one of the biggest management consulting platform we train people to get into bcg bain mckinsey at a very affordable price we are competing with like literally uh european companies that charge 100x for our for the type of services that we offer and we are doing it at a very low price through a subscription based model so that's one of the startups in which i have invested now over time i have ended up investing in different bunch of startups again which promotes like passive learning now uh this this brings me to the last phase of my life which is around what type of system am i trying to develop now because i have invested in a bunch of startups passive money great but every time i start to i try to start a new business what it ends up doing it ends up eating a lot of my time because building from 0 to 1 any type of startup it's super super difficult right so it requires a lot of time so now i'm trying to move towards a system which is called as hands off system of building businesses where i can delegate a lot of work to people who are working with me that does not mean that i'm not involved but i'm trying to figure out like a way where my if my per hour cost or price that i know is x and if i can delegate it less than x then i go and delegate that work so that is the type of system that i'm trying to master few key takeaways from these four stories is very simple that you need to be efficient you need to have some kind of system going some kind of system that you believe in that in that particular phase of your life right right from me being a, a cricketer when i was very young now to being an entrepreneur investor i have different systems that are going on and these systems allow you to explore life in a more holistic manner that is my fundamental understanding now you might ask me that okay great awesome all these systems work for you tell us like what system we absolutely need to develop and how to do it can you get guide us like in terms of developing that initial system right in terms of money creation so uh, first and foremost one important system that all of us need to develop absolutely need to develop is that we need to develop a system to invest our money now why because so let me give you a couple of examples here right so first and foremost all of us will be making money whether we make 1000 rupees or whether we make 10000 rupees or 1 lakh or 2 lakh that's secondary whatever money you are making you will have to invest it right why do you need to invest it because you will say that okay i'll making like 100 rupees i'll keep it in my pocket the issue is that we need to invest that money because the money loses value every single year right right now we are living in a very high inflation environment some year it loses more value some year it loses less value but the point is that the money loses value especially in a country like india to help you contextualize this imagine that you have 100 rupees saved in your bank account in your savings account be it sbi be it hdfc bank you have that 100 rupee lying in your bank account you are getting a rate of return of 2% 2 to 2 and a half 3% as your savings deposit the inflation rate in india is currently 6 and a half percent so you are in real terms losing 4 and a half percent 4 4 and a half percent right so that 100 rupee that you have kept in your bank account it will become for sure 96 rupees by next year in real terms right and that is precisely the reason why you need to invest now when i share that simple piece of fact or data with people they get bothered they start fretting about the fact that you know what just tell us should i just go and invest in doge coin or should i just go and invest in like this particular fancy stuff that i've just heard about should i do it because i am a maximalist i need maximum return for my money because okay on the left hand side of the equation i was just making like 4% return on it but now i need to make like 100% return on it right so the point is that you are not trying to develop a system by this type of a thought process the system should be 
this, and this is where I would try to conclude my talk. But first and foremost, if you are looking to build wealth over time, it's a slow process. You get rich slow. You don't get rich fast. That is point one. Point two is that you need to have a system of earning money. You have need to have a system of investing money. If you're looking to develop and cultivate a system for investing money, then the thought that I would leave you with is this. First and foremost, please invest. That is literally half the battle one that you need to invest. Number two, please invest. Start your investing journey by investing in safe assets. Three, don't be a maximalist. Maximalist means that hey, either it's going to be 100% return for me or no return for me. Right? So please don't do that because there is something called as rule of 72. So rule of 72 means that take 72, divide it by the return that you're making. For example, if you're making FD returns, then FD returns are 72 by six, right? So it takes you 12 years to double your money, right? So 72 divided by six, that is 12. So it takes 12 years to double your money in a fixed deposit. Now, if you just go and invest in index funds, right, uh, which is nifty, right, in India, then that is 72 divided by 12 to 15%, right? So that is the nifty return historically. So it takes you four and a half percent, four and a half years to double your money, right? So essentially what I'm trying to tell you is that if you are able to grow your money at a 15% sensible rate, then your money doubles every four, four and a half years and you automatically become rich by using a simple system. So in order to become rich or in order to generate wealth, create systems, create good habits, invest and best of luck, right? That's what I would leave you with. Thank you so much. And that's, that's pretty much it from us. Thank you for your talk, Mr. Srivastav. Next, we have Mr. Gauranga Das. Mr. Das is a B.Tech from IIT Bombay and is the director of Govardhan Eco Village GEV, and the first NGO in India to receive the United Nations World Tourism Organization Award. GEV is also affiliated to the United Nations Economic and Social Council, UNCCD, and UNEP bodies of the United Nations and has received several national and international awards. He is also the Global Duty Officer at International Society for Krishna Consciousness, ISKCON. As a social reformer, he is facilitating the economic and social development of over 78 tribal villages in Palghar. And today, he'll be speaking about a small conversation that wins a battle. We now invite you to deliver your talk. Thank you so much. Our days are filled with choices. Even when we hand over the choice to someone else, we have chosen to do that. Life is a matter of choices. And every choice you make makes you, says John Maxwell. People spend too much time focusing on the exceptional, the uncommon, the rare. This is unfortunate given the infrequency of such said big moments and the unlikeliness that most of us will have the courage, time, and the planning skills to undertake most major challenges. Think small and go big. The butterfly effect describes the phenomena that a small event can have very large consequences. The butterfly effect says that the flapping of wings of a butterfly in America can generate a hurricane in Asia. Metaphorically, it indicates the impact of something so simple that can happen all over the world. John Wooden makes a great point about decisions. There is a choice you have to make in everything you do and keep in mind at the end, the choice you make makes you. The sum total of all the little decisions determine outcomes such as health, reputation, knowledge, security, productivity, trustworthiness. Many examples exist of instances where a tiny detail led to a dramatic change. In each case, the world we live in would be different if the situation had been reversed. First, the bombing of Nagasaki. The US initially intended to bomb the Japanese city of Kuroko with the ammunition factory as a target, but due to cloudy weather conditions, the airplane passed over the city three times before the pilots gave up due to lack of visibility. Military personnel decided on Nagasaki as a target due to improved visibility. The implications of the split second decision was Monumental, the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna rejected Adolf Hitler's application 
Twice in the early 1900s, a young Hitler applied for the art school and was rejected by his own estimation and that of scholars. This rejection was to shape the metamorphosis from an aspiring artist into the human manifestation of evil. Third, the assassination of Archduke Franz Ferdinand. On the 28th of June, 1914, a teenage Bosnian Serb named Garvilo Philip Princip went to Sarajevo with two other nationalists to assassinate the Archduke. The initial assassination attempt failed. The bomber grenade exploded beneath the car behind the Archduke's and wounded its occupants. The route was supposed to be changed after that, but the driver did not get the message. He had actually taken the alternative route. He would actually have saved the Archduke and Princip would not have had the chance to shoot the Archduke on that day. Were it not for the failure of communication, both world wars might never have happened. Fourth is the example of the Chernobyl disaster. In 1986, a test at the Chernobyl nuclear plant went awry and released 400 times the radiation produced by the bombing of Hiroshima. 115,000 people were evacuated from the area with many deaths and birth defects resulting from the radiation. Even today, some areas remain too dangerous to visit. However, it could have been much worse. After the initial explosion, three plant workers volunteered to turn off the underwater walls to prevent a second explosion, diving into a dark basement flooded with radioactive water, which was a heroic act. Had they failed to turn off the wall, half of Europe would have been destroyed and rendered uninhabitable for half a million years. Russia, Ukraine, and Kyiv would also have become unfit for human habitation. Whether they lived or not, the three men still the wings of a deadly butterfly. Fifth is the example of the Cuban Missile Crisis. We all owe our lives to a single Russian Navy officer named Vasily Akhipov, who has been called the man who saved the world. During the Cuban Missile Crisis, Akhipov was stationed on the nuclear armed submarine near Cuba. American aircraft and ships began using depth charges to signal the submarine that it could surface so that it could be identified with the submarine submerged too deep to monitor radio signals. The crew had no idea what was going on in the world above. The captain Savitsky decided that the signal meant that war had broken out and he prepared to launch a nuclear torpedo. Everyone agreed with him except Akipo. Had the torpedo launched, nuclear clouds would have hit Moscow, London, East Anglia and Germany before wiping out half of the British population. The result would have been a worldwide nuclear holocaust as countries retaliated and the conflict would have spread. Yet, within an overheated underwater room, Akhipo exercised his veto power and prevented a launch. Without the courage of one man, our world could have been unimaginably different. From this handful of examples, it is clear how fragile the world is and how dire the effects of tiny events can be on the starting conditions. Human life is beset with incessant problems of varying degrees. The Gita, the Bhagavad Gita, analyzes the root cause of these problems and offers a solution to decisively end their flow. All human beings tend to seek pleasure and avoid pain, but every pleasure that is pursued in the material world is ephemeral and thus ultimately culminates in misery, anxiety, and dejection. Similarly, most solutions to avoid pain end in further suffering, just as medicines, even when necessary to counteract a painful disease, create unpleasant side effects of their own. Many times, the intended cure results in more trouble than the disease itself. Life is a battle at every moment, and it takes only a moment in a battlefield to define victory or defeat. Let's look at an example of Arjuna. Who is Arjuna? Arjuna is one of the most powerful warriors who is actually 
the controller of the whole universe at that particular point of time. But Arjuna, who is still personified, is faced with a small change in the army formation when Krishna puts his chariot in front of grandfather Bhishma and teacher Drona. He goes through a stormy introspection when his confidence gives way to confusion about his identity. Am I a warrior supposed to kill my enemy? Am I a grandson who is supposed to love my grandfather Bhishma or kill him? Am I a student who is supposed to respect my teacher Drona or kill him? Bhishma Drona Pramukhata Sarveksham Cha Mahikshatam Uvacha Partha Pashyaitan Samavetan Kurun Iti. There were 640 million soldiers assembled on the battlefield, but the battle veteran like Arjuna with a track record of superb fighting skills, he just subject himself to despair just by seeing two people out of 640 million people, Bhishma and Drona. Two is a small number compared to 640 million. Arjuna had the skill to fight, but by being confronted by a scenario he did not expect, he lost the will to fight. That's the perfect recipe for anxiety, despair, and depression. Worry does not empty tomorrow of its sorrow. It empties today of its strength. Only when a crisis is sudden and intense does one grow sensitive to seek relief. What solved Arjuna's depression and decision-making paralysis? Did Arjuna resort to acts which facilitate forgetfulness with addictions? Arjuna faced the crisis head-on by having a small conversation of one hour with Krishna. That conversation is famous as the Bhagavad Gita. How did Krishna resolve Arjuna's doubt? By resolving the cause of Arjuna's confusion and doubt, Arjuna's identity crisis. The COVID pandemic created situations which put many in an identity crisis. The conditioned soul's identity is a conglomerate formed by his gross and subtle attachments. When he says I, it doesn't refer to his original identity, but to the I that is formed by the sum total of the acquired brother, sisters, mother, friends, land, wealth, social position, and so on. This condition identity changes as the object it is shaped by changes. For example, a married woman gives birth to a son and acquires new identity of mother. Now, if her son were to die, her identity as a mother would also perish and be seriously affected. This means that the identity of mother is relative to the existence of the son and therefore cannot be considered absolute. Though we are, those we are connected with are called relatives because of our identity is relative to them. When any one of them dies, some part of the conglomerate I dies and vice versa. In the conditioned state, the conglomerate I is dependent on what is considered mine. In fact, without mine, there is no I. This possessiveness is undesirable because when that which is mine undergoes a change, it triggers a concurrent change in me. This was Arjuna's predicament. He thought, oh my God, I'm being called upon to kill my relatives. If I do it, it will create drastic change in me. If my relatives die, what will become of me? Arjuna was confronted with his own death or a change or loss of identity. Change and loss are almost always feared. And change or loss of personal identity is most disconcerting. Arjuna considered killing his relatives as tantamount to suicide and expressed this later by saying, bereft of them, I have no desire to live. What is the meaning of living without them? Therefore, we in this world are influenced by this desire to possess and the desire to control. And thus, this was the root cause of Arjuna's major issues. Arjuna was introspecting and trying to understand what is what. Adults treat others as if they were toys. For example, if a son disobeys his father, he becomes upset and punishes or disowns the son. In this way, we can see how in relationships, the attachment carries the sense of ownership is actually a form of violence disguised as love. This love lasts as long as the other person behaves according to our wishes. When the object of love behaves contrarily, either we tolerate, become angry, or severe the relationship. One may think Arjuna non-violent for wanting to leave the battlefield, but he was inspired by the very basis of violence, which is attachment. One is not affected seriously if the neighbor he hardly knows dies, but when a close relative dies, he feels a vacuum in his heart and stomach. This is the effect of 
attachment. In such a scenario, we become totally bewildered, totally lost. We become totally dependent on trying to figure out what is going on. Krishna resolved Arjuna's doubt by revealing his eternal identity, Swarupa, as the Atman and his duty, Dharma, as Seva. Krishna revealed to Arjuna the knowledge of the Gita as follows. The soul is bulletproof, fireproof, waterproof, and windproof, and timeproof. Those who commit to nothing are distracted by everything. Don't compare yourself to others. Compare yourself only with the person you were yesterday. Happiness comes not by maximizing our positions, but by minimizing our attachments. Our caliber is not seen just when we give life our best, but when life gives us its worst. The Bhagavad Gita empowers us to reclaim our destiny, to do our best, to bring out our best and to attain the best because a thought is persistent, doesn't make it pertinent. Learn to peruse your thoughts. Worry is the interest we pay on loans we have not yet taken. Getting opportunities is providence. Grabbing opportunities is diligence. Our choice has a louder voice than our voice. What we do speaks louder than what we say. Faith means the willingness to relinquish our control, focus on the present, but don't fragment it from the future. Talk less about yourself. Talk more to yourself. We become dissatisfied not because of what we don't have, but because we don't see what we have. Discipline is the fusion of intention with action. Be detached from the results, not from the goals. Setting goals increases our focus. Worrying about the results erodes our focus. To relish satisfaction, replace expectation with appreciation. Activity, productivity, and connectivity are no substitute for spirituality. Resentment of reality often hurts more than reality itself. Admitting our weaknesses doesn't make us weak. Submitting to them does. Determination means subordinate pleasure to your purpose. What others think about us after death doesn't matter as much as what we think of at the time of our death. Our post-mortem destination is determined by our disposition, not by our reputation. Happiness comes not by collecting the material, but by recollecting the spiritual. Tolerance means to call off our war with reality. The essence of liberation is not transportation, but transformation. And what binds us is not where we are located, but where our desires are directed. Humility means to not let our ego come in the way of our purpose. Birds can't fly without breaking their shells. We can't fly and fulfill our destiny without breaking our conditioning. The world is a classroom, not a courtroom. Focus on learning, not on accusing or defending. Even if we can't get over things, we can still get on with things. Don't let roadblocks become mental blocks. We can't undo, but we can rebuild. Don't deny past mistakes, but don't let those mistakes control the present. The source of misery is not frustration of desire, but domination by desire. When our vision changes from competition to contribution and collaboration, life becomes a celebration. To understand God's provision, first understand God's vision. Don't just read the Gita, heed the Gita. In 1922, a young man visited a saint on the terrace of a building located at 1 Ultadanga Junction Road, Kolkata. The moment the young man offered his respects to the saint, the saint said, you are an intelligent young man. You must spread the message of Lord Chaitanya and Sanatan Dharma in the English language all over the world. In 1933, this young man became the disciple of the saint. In 1944, started the Back to Godhead magazine. In 1955, he retired from family life. And in 1966, he established ISKCON, the International Society for Krishna Consciousness in New York, having gone on a cargo liner Jaladuta with only 40 rupees in his pocket at the age of 70. That young man, who met the saint in 1922 is none other than his divine gracious A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, the founder of ISKCON, who received the small seed of the mission in a one-line conversation with Srila Bhaktisiddhanta Saraswati Thakur. The small rooftop conversation of 1922 has resulted in a massive worldwide movement today in 2021 
transforming the hearts of millions with over 700 ISKCON temples globally, 110 sattvic restaurants, 65 eco villages, 500 million Bhagavad Gita's distributed, 9 million annual visitors, 2 million meals served daily by more than 200 projects and 6,000 festivals held annually in ISKCON temples worldwide. In 1969, one such young American, Sham Sundar Das, he came and contact with Srila Prabhupada and then he was about to be sent to the prison and Prabhupada said, very soon you'll be sent out. And actually it happened. Srila Prabhupada encouraged him saying that by the Lord's will, anything can happen. After Sham Sundar Das began serving his sentence in the prison, he suddenly received a release order from the prison in 1969 itself. The release order appeared small, but as a result of that, Sham Sundar Das went to London in 1970 and connected with the Beatles and inspired the celebrity Beatles, George Harrison, who composed songs glorifying Krishna, which became global chart busters. Sham Sundar Das also was a pioneer in coming to India and organized the Cross Maidan Pandal program in 1971. On one of the days of the Cross Maidan festival, Srila Prabhupada sent one of his disciples to fetch one young American boy standing in the corner of a crowd of 40,000 to the stage. It appeared to be a small, insignificant gesture. This young boy who was brought onto the stage was Radhanath Swami, the author of The Journey Home and the founder of the Iskon Chopati community. On a flight from Bhuvaneshwar to Mumbai in March 2009, Radhanath Swami had a small conversation with me about his dream for a community centered around spirituality, sustainability, and social inclusion. This emotionally surcharged brief conversation was the seed for establishing the United Nations accredited and United Nations awarded Govardhan Eco Village, which is a sterling example of the application of the message of the Bhagavad Gita for climate change adaptation and United Nations sustainable development goals. That's my own humble experience of a small conversation, which was minuscule yet monumental. I would like to end with a one minute video. Over to the video. Rampant illiteracy, malnutrition, and lack of infrastructure. This is the story of WADA, one of India's most backward tribal areas. However, since 2010, ecotourism has become a lifeline for this region. Govardhan Eco Village's sustainable development model, which is based on harmony with the self, the environment, and the divine, has helped employ over 300 tribal families. More than 60,000 tribals have been provided free medical care. Thirty thousand free meals. Thirty thousand free meals. Thirty thousand free meals. are provided to school children every day. Over 60 bore wells have been installed. More than 300 families received training in organic farming. Govardhan Eco Village has transformed the lives of the most deprived communities in the world. Thank you so much, Mr. Gauranga Das. Our next speaker is Mr. Ankit Agrawal. Mr. Ankit Agrawal, founder and CEO, Dare to Compete, is not your typical engineering plus MBA guy. From studying in college to getting a 100% scholarship from Harvard Business School for a coveted leadership program, the entrepreneur within him was kicking him all this while. He knew where he wanted to be and that made him opt out of summer placement during his MBA and choose the organizations where his skills could be polished for his big dream. It was after working with industry giants like Sapient and Deloitte and improving the education and equity crisis by dedicating three years to Teach for India that he finally led that entrepreneur on the loose and set out on a journey to disrupt the education space. Failure never let him and success never got to his head. His entrepreneurial venture, Dare to Compete, presently serves over 2 million users from 20,000 plus companies and colleges across domains, including B schools, engineering colleges, arts and science. Mr. Ankit, with his team, aims to gamify learning, engagement 
and hiring while connecting all the relevant stakeholders on a single platform. We now invite you to deliver your talk. Hi everyone. I hope you guys are having a good day. Today's talk is all about the topic minuscule yet monumental. Essentially, the meaning is that how small things that you do in your day-to-day -day life, how those small things can create a very, very monumental impact in the outcomes, whether those are professionally, within, within you, personally, or for your entrepreneurial or your managerial journey. Now, when I was given this topic, I was thinking through as to how do, you, how do I create uh, a meaningful talk about it. And then I thought, then let me dive into my life to figure out what was those uh, smaller activities or smaller thoughts that created Dare to Compete what it is today. Let me start with a story. And throughout the story, I'll be connecting few dots to, to, to sort of make you realize as to how I, I have transformed Dare to Compete from just a blog during my MBA days and to a platform which it is today. The first step that I took, uh, and this is, uh, I think, about half a decade back, is to think through, should I really be jumping in full time into my venture because it was a blog right so i was i was working i was uh, uh, working with industry giants like deloitte and on a part-time basis i was doing uh, a dare to compete as a blog luckily for me two things happened which clicked the first thing is that we got two clients approaching us very very big clients approaching us that hey can you do some engagements with us and we'll be able to pay you that basically clicked that, hey, I believe that there can be a business model curated uh, out of Dare to Compete. And that was the first trigger. And the second trigger, wherein I wanted to see what is that business model. So I thought that let me create events and competitions of my own. The first thing that I did was to figure out what should be that competition and how do i gather sponsorships and this is way back so it it may sound as if uh, an immature or uh, a student organizer is talking but that how i was about uh, uh, half a decade back when i was just starting off and i think because i was in that mindset i i started taking very very small steps and then think it through. And I'll tell you how taking those small steps and not thinking it through helped me, right? So the first event that we gathered basically uh, on uh, Tihar Jail. So I was going through uh, one uh, uh, video or an article and I soon realized that TJ's Tihar Jail has an FMCG brand called TJ's. They were doing a revenue of close to about 40 to 50 crores. So instantly I thought that why not let me work with the hard jail, I mean the whole office and figure out if we can create a competition, a case study about the hard jail, how their uh, prisoners are creating a huge FMCG brand. Right. So the first step that I did, I didn't have any appointments or so, right? But I thought that let me directly go to Tihar jail and figure out, see, I, I didn't have anything to lose because I didn't know where to start. So what I did, I went to Tihar jail. Uh, uh, there is an uh, Tihar jail assistant commissioner of police or commissioner of police. I, still, I don't remember it, but it was a huge compound. At the gate, I was asked that, uh, whom do you want to meet? And I just said that, hey, I want to meet the, the commissioner uh, of police uh, who's handling the hard jail and I mean fortunately for me uh, the person at the gate allowed me to go inside when I went inside 
the receptionist asked me that do you have an appointment and i was very very open i said that no ma'am i don't have the appointment i am just a student and i just wanted to meet commissioner of police because i think i can do something for a uh, tjs uh, which are products made by tihar jail prisoners and i can help them uh, sort of uh, move forward and have a more uh, uh, brand equity created as well as more sales now i wasn't sure whether i'll be able to do that or not but I, i i said that right and then she agreed she she went inside luckily the commissioner was also there and he agreed to meet right when we met uh actually i, I at, at that point in time as well i didn't have a, a ppt or a deck created very frankly right but i had that idea of doing something with tjs and tihar jail as a brand to make it bigger and that's what i explained him he understood he appreciated that this is the first time somebody has approached them to make tjs much bigger than what it is right now and he agreed so the idea was that i will get a professor a uh, marketing professional will create a case study on tj and then possibly move forward uh, uh, uh by rolling it out to all the student community uh, across the b schools and the e schools and we will give them innovative ideas and possibly some very very good uh, uh, ideas to implement to increase sales they agreed right so that was the first step very very small step that i took that hey i went to the hard jail itself right the second step in this journey in this example was that now i have already sold this to the hard jail i have their backing right now whom should i approach to create that case study because i knew that i can't create the case study so uh, uh i went to my marketing professor uh and again i mean uh, i didn't have his number or so i just went to the college because it was my college i was i was allowed inside i was able to meet couple of professors uh, just i mean on on my way to the marketing professor then i went when i went ahead and met the marketing professor he was very open to doing this because he said that this looks like a novice idea this looks different to let me also uh, try my hands on it right uh and so so that's it i mean i i went uh, and met the commissioner once i got his uh, uh blessings and uh, approval to do a case study i went to the marketing professor uh, he's very very good at doing his job so he agreed and that was the two steps right the third step was that uh we also got the permission to go out internally some 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 policemen were with us me and the professor to roam around the tihar jail talk to the 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 prisoners how are they creating biscuits there were there were multiple other sqs as well that they were creating and we could sort of figure out that hey i think they are doing very very fabulous because at the end of the day when you are actually in there as a prisoner as well these activities there were multiple activities that they were doing and all these activities were actually ensuring that the prisoners are earning some money so once they get out they have something in their pocket to be spent and to start their life with that was very very nice right so then uh, we created the case study the case study was ready so the next step was to actually launch the competition and i'll tell you these steps worked well in my favor the step to go to the commissioner the step to go to the professor and the step to create the case study all three worked well now the fourth step that i was taking and i was very nervous was to approach uh, corporates to be to sort of take part because if you have to launch a case study there has to be some prizes there has to be some operational expenses and not not that small right i spent so all of this what i've what i've told you until now took about a month's time right but the next two months i spent in basically talking to all i i i i would have spoken close to about 20 25 companies and unfortunately for me none of them agreed to participate in this particular case challenge and why only because they were not sure 
in terms of associating with a brand yeah, like teaches and tehar jail what it would do to their brand a smaller brand in itself won't give us any limelight in terms of launching a competition or so but none of the bigger brands uh, wanted to try their hands in this particular case study competition right so eventually we were not able to launch that competition right but i i don't read that as a failure because that was the first time i was trying out things by myself and i was very very happy the whole whole thing all the steps that i took the whole thing gave me courage to basically go solo and start everything by myself and i was very very clear that hey if i'm taking about five steps three may go forward the other two may put me on the back foot and i was okay with it because the three were moving forward so in fact effectively if i'm taking five steps i'm actually moving one step ahead right but the biggest learning that i could do was that the first step is critical but then every step adds on to your journey and to grow you need to take leaps and move or jump many steps at one go and the biggest thing uh, what i think now is the first step to be audible is to ensure that you're speaking now this is a very very nice statement right i'll, I'll just repeat it the first step to be audible is to ensure that you're speaking which is to say if you are not speaking nobody will be able to hear you and that's what i uh, sensed when i went into this tihar jail journey it was very very fabulous experience everybody sort of loved it i loved it for whatever work we did though the result was not in my favor but that gave me courage to start off right and within a i think within 6 months i established a team and i i basically launched few uh, products of dare to compete and moved forward so it was fabulous so the only the only thing is that when i took those small steps and at that point in time i i didn't know what those steps will end up in but i was very very happy with the outcome right now that was the first story the other aspects and i'll dive into two more aspects of uh, how dare to compete became what it is right now one is the whole technology platform right when the whole technology platform when you're building a technology platform the first thing is that you also need to identify what all features the platform should have right what are the latent needs of the users that you would want to incorporate within the platform so that it basically creates a stickiness in the user and there is definitely a need for such a platform right so uh, we did many things we, we when we were launching it it was so for me it was a discovery led model we were always trying out new things uh, when we were trying out 10 things two or three were clicking but the rest were not clicking right and i'll i'll give you one one very very small or specific example it has nothing to do with any bigger functionality or so but in the registration form very recently earlier we used to say that gender male female and that's it right now the the community or the world is becoming more inclusive and open right so what we did was that hey we we wanted our registration form to be global in nature inclusive in nature and we basically incorporated more genders uh in uh, uh, uh in in that registration form right but we did a mistake so when we when we incorporated gender the the team that was incorporating the gender were confused between gender and sexuality so the first thing that went live and that was there for about a day or so and then we realized that that's not proper was that hey uh, so male female is there just to just to point it out probably many of you wouldn't know right uh, sexuality is let's say uh, uh, 
gay, lesbian, all those are sexuality, right? But the genders are uh, uh, by gender uh, and uh, uh, the others, right, which are not related to the sexuality as such. Then it was also very, very critical. And this very, very small feedback that came from the user is that, hey, and this was, I think, only two users said us and we implemented it that, hey, I may prefer not to say or not to disclose my, my, my gender. And the second user said that, hey, possibly your list is not exhaustive. That made us realize that why don't we put across two options? One, prefer not to say. And the second was that let me specify. Because in this age, there are things that are happening, which are uh, the world is moving so fast that we can't be sure as to whether we are putting across all the options that are there. So, so these two things were very, very nice. And trust me, after implementing this, many users have been sending us emails in a very, very positive note that, hey, uh, these are very, very small changes that you have done. But this reflects your brand that Dare to Compete as a brand is sort of moving forward and is more open and inclusive in nature. So you, you get it in just just creating one good i would say parameter in the registration form created a, a better brand equity and better brand resonance so in the end i would basically say that look at it like a compounding effect right let me again go through it right if i wouldn't have taken the first step of the tihar jail I wouldn't have been courageous enough to go solo and start Dare to Compete as a platform, right? If we would, wouldn't would have taken very, very small steps in terms of just reading through all the emails, those even two-liner emails, thinking through those two-liner emails for about a minute, getting that inside, then the product of Dare to Compete wouldn't have been what it is right now. And if we wouldn't have implemented those process enhancements, no matter how small they are, right, we wouldn't have scaled or have seen growth in our revenue numbers, right? So no matter how small things are there or the activities that you take, all these accumulate to become very, very big overall, right? So I would, I would uh, uh, close by saying, that no matter what, whether you're an entrepreneur or a manager or just a student, right? Don't shy away from taking that small step. No matter how small it is, you may not know what the benefit of that small step would be. But uh, I know for a fact that it will be good. Thank you for your talk, Mr. Agarwal. Now let's hear it from our next speaker, Ms. Shaheen Misri. Ms. Shaheen is an Indian social activist and an educator. She is the founder of Akansha Foundation, an Indian nonprofit educational initiative in Mumbai and Pune, and is also the founder and CEO of Teach for India since 2008. Ms. Shaheen has been an Ashoka Fellow, a global leader for tomorrow at the World Economic Forum and an Asia Society 21 leader. The topic of our speech will be little action towards our mission of equity. We now invite you to deliver your talk. Thank you so much. Uh, Yeah. Uh, uh, 
Um, sorry, one second. Can you see me? Uh, yes, ma'am, we can see you, but it's lagging actually. Okay. It's Hello? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I think there's some bad to... Yeah, we can hear you, but your video is lagging actually, and voice is also breaking at times. Can you? Uh... You can switch off your video and uh, just try to speak once. Maybe it's the bandwidth problem. Uh, okay. Will you let me can see my screen though? Just one. Minute. Yeah, you, you can start sharing. Can you see? Are you able yes, to see my screen? Yes, yes, we can see oh. our screen now. Okay, great. So sorry about that. So okay. I'll keep going. Um, I was I, I started by sharing how as a younger person I thought I could change the world, then the country, then the city, and finally I became a little bit wiser and realized that I couldn't even change my two daughters at home. And yet I did realize this one thing over time that slowly I could begin to change myself. I remember being asked one day to imagine my 80th birthday. And I ask you to imagine this with me, even if you're very, very young listening into this call, but imagine these chairs are all filled. It's your 80th birthday and they're filled with all the people who you love the most in the world. And then imagine that one of your friends stands up to talk about the way that you lived your life. What would you want them to say? And so I remember thinking, um, this is incredible. This was Martin Luther King's eulogy that he wrote about the way that he would want to be remembered. And he says, tell him not to mention that I have a Nobel Peace Prize. That isn't important. Tell him not to mention that I have 300 or 400 other awards. That's not important. Tell him not to mention where I went to school. I'd like somebody to mention that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to give his life serving others. I'd like for somebody to say that day that Martin Luther King Jr. tried to love somebody. I want you to say that day that I tried to be right on the war question. I want you to be able to say that I tried to feed the hungry, that I tried to clothe the naked, that I tried to visit those who were in prison. I want you to say that I tried to love and serve humanity. And so when we think about that, how we want to be known at our 80th birthday, after we are no more, I asked myself as I was preparing for this talk, what would I want people to say? And here's what I came up with. I would want people to say that I heard, I saw, I felt, and I took little steps. Meet Ajay one of our Teach for India fellows who came into his classroom and very soon realized that he had a student in class who had gone, who had been at her village, stumbled onto a train playing a stationary train when she was very young. The train had started. She had found herself suddenly in Delhi, completely away from her family and she didn't remember anything. 
Ajay, every single day after class, sat with her, trying to get her to jog her memory, trying to get her to remember uh, the name of her village or anything that she could remember. And finally, with just a description of the train station and no name, he took a small passport size photo and went looking for her family. Four years later, she was reunited with her family. What an incredible thing to hear. I have seen incredible things. Meet here two very different men. On the left, my mentor in Ahmedabad, Jayeshpai. On the right, my brother in New York, who's a fashion photographer. One day, the two of them met. And they met in Ahmedabad, and Rashad and Jayeshpai were walking down a very crowded Ahmedabad street with me. And Rashad is a, is a smoker. And Jayeshpai saw a stranger who was smoking, a young man. And he went up to that stranger and put his arm around his shoulder and told him smoking was not good for him. And I saw my brother looking very strangely. How can you talk to a stranger about the fact that they're smoking? And with a big smile on his face, the stranger gave Jayeshpai his cigarette and Jayeshpai stamped out his cigarette. On the same day, this happened three times, three strangers smoking, Jayeshpai telling them not to smoke, them putting out their cigarette. At the end of the three times, my brother turned to Jayeshpai and said, Jayeshpai, what are you doing? Aren't you worried? These are strangers. They could say anything to you. Jayeshpai turns and tells Rashad, they aren't strangers. They are my brothers and sisters. Wouldn't you do that for your brother or sister? I've seen incredible things. Finally, I felt such beautiful things. Meet Latif, one of my Akanksha students. You see him here starring in one of our Akanksha musicals. Tragically, Latif passed away at a very young age. And I remember being there the day after he passed away in his home with his grandfather, who told me tears streaming down his eyes. Didi, I gave Latif 14,000 rupees. I gave him 14,000 rupees to go to a good hospital. But because he didn't want me to go back to work, he hid the 14,000 rupees, went to a government hospital, passed away 12 hours later. Now, we'll never know whether Latif would have passed away in a better hospital or not. But what I did know in that moment was how incredibly large our ability as human beings, our ability to give our humanity, how beautiful that is. I felt something beautiful that day. And so 30 years ago, when I started my journey, this was the first little girl I met. Her name is Pinky. You'll see her bright eyes of potential down the 30 year roller coaster of working for children um, in India. What am I learning about small steps? The first thing, great change is possible with education. Meet Sangeeta, one of our students who was a very average student in class, you may not have even noticed her in, in a regular classroom, step by step with her teacher's love and support. She today has her own school in her own community in Mankud, fundamentally putting more children on a different life path with small steps that got her there. See this beautiful image um, and this idea that the power of education lies in reimagining its purpose. Education is not just about taking small steps for yourself, but taking small steps to learn how to be with another. You see that the love in this image as Udaibai hugs a young adult that he's just met. And education is not just about self and other, 
but it's about making a country better. You see this beautiful image of Bhavna Didi taking a photograph with her mobile phone. She for 40 years has been working with children who are mentally challenged. And when I met her in Ahmedabad a couple of weeks ago, she told me how she had very, very bad COVID. She was in the hospital. She didn't know if she would survive. She said, I told myself one thing at that time. I will go to one of two homes. Either I will come back to this home, she meant her school, or I will go up to his home, she meant God's home. What dedication. That is what the power of education learning can be. Leadership and laddership um, matter. I, I don't know how many of you are familiar with this term laddership, um, but it's the idea that leaders are really ladders for others because every single person has the capability to lead and to be a leader. You see in this beautiful image, a few kids that I met um, a few weeks ago, and I asked them, I said, what are you doing? And they said, dukan banana hai. And I said, dukan. And they said, yes. And, and you know, when you go to a little shop, you'll see the chip packets hanging um, from, from the shop. And what they were doing, if, if you see in the images, they were taking those rocks no glue, no adhesive, and they were banging the packets together so hard that they could become the hanging chips in their make-believe shop. Look at that creativity. Look at that creative, critical thinking. Look at that resourcefulness at the age of maybe five or six. All of us can lead, not in the future, but today. And this image of, of my colleague Kritika um, that I caught, I caught her in a beautiful moment, so connected um, to this tree um, on a walk that we were taking. The idea that really what will shift the world is not big things, but little acts of love that remind us that we are deeply interconnected. If we learn to love in small ways ourselves, each other, the work we do, the home we live in, the country, the world, well, then all our actions will change. I want to share one last story uh, that I think is such a beautiful example of small steps. This was narrated to me by a dear friend of mine. The man on the screen is Julio. And the story goes like this. Julio was walking down um, a very dark, deserted road in the middle of winter. And from the other side, a young teenager approached him, a hoodie covering his head. And as he got closer to Julio, he pulled out a knife and he said, give me your wallet. Um, Julio, very scared, like any of us would have been, took out his wallet, gave it to the youngster. The youngster turned to run away. But then Julio did something different. As the youngster was running away, Julio said, wait, kid. Kid turned around. He said, it's a very cold night and you don't have a thick coat. Why don't you take my coat? Kid was very confused, but he came back, grabbed the coat, ran off again. And Julio again turned around and said, wait a minute, kid, have you had dinner? Why don't you come down and have dinner at the diner down the road? I was gonna go there to get a bite. So unlikely, Julio and this young kid who had mugged him just minutes before sat down, had a three hour dinner. The kid spoke about his life, about his struggles. Um, and at the end of, of the dinner, the bill came. And Julio smiled and said, you know, kid, under normal circumstances, I would have paid for the bill, but you have my wallet. And the kid smiles and takes out the wallet, throws it across the table and gives it back to Julio. And Julio looks at the kid in the eyes and says, kid, that's not enough. I want your knife too. And the kid slowly takes the knife out throws it across the table, and the two go their separate way. The reason I end with that story is because I don't think that was a fluke moment in Julio's life. 
I think through his entire life, he had been practicing small acts of compassion so that when confronted by physical danger, his first and instinctive reaction was to react with compassion. If we are to build an India free of poverty, filled with love, if we are to live in a world free of poverty and filled with love, it's gonna take not a few of us doing big things, but all of us coming together with love, believing that everybody can lead, taking little steps, holding hands on the long road to that world. Thank you so much. Thank you for your talk, Ms. Shaheen. Now we'll have a short break of 15 minutes. Stay tuned for some more inspiring and interesting talks.
Welcome back. I hope you are all ready for some more enlightening talks. Request you all to keep yourselves on mute throughout the evening and keep your videos off to ensure maximum bandwidth. The event is supported by our gifting partner, Leo Berry Gifts and Ostrich Design Company. Video editing partner, Yashna Bhari and content partner, Tina Mana. Let's hear it from our next speaker, Mr. Samir Dhanrajani. Mr. Dhanrajani is the Chief Executive Officer at AI Curate, a bespoke global AI advisory and consulting firm and president, 3AI, India's largest platform for AI and analytics, leaders and professionals. Previously, Mr. Samir has worked as Chief Strategy Officer, Fractal Analytics, Global Business Leader at Cognizant and Country Head at Fidelity National Financial. He is a best-selling author, well-recognized keynote speaker and speaker at several global industry forums and conferences. He has also been featured in numerous news publications and has received multiple industry awards and accolades and is considered to be an influential voice in the AI and analytics industry. Mr. Samir will share his thoughts on reimagined decision-making with AI, the unknown yet the biggest one. So we now invite you to deliver your talk. Hi, everyone. Human beings are predictably irrational. And this is not what I'm saying. Dan Ariely, in his book, Predictably Irrational, came out with this statement. And there is a reason behind that. As human, we take close to about 60 odd decisions on any given day, strategic, operational, tactical. What's my plan after this talk? What is that I'm going to do with my career? What's my relationship status going to be? Now, some of these decisions on the personal and enterprise side, we are taking on a daily basis. Over the past few years, we've been taking decisions through our intuition, gut, influenced by our friends, maybe spouses. With the algorithms coming in, the decision-making has changed. It's becoming quite significant, even for smaller decisions. Let's look at how. I want to start with a story. This is a real life story. This is a story of a gentleman called Makato, the young looking guy who's at the back of the picture standing with his parents. Makato is born and bred up in Japan and he finished his engineering. That's the time this particular picture was taken. His parents are farmers in Japan. Farming is still considered to be a very revered sought after occupation in Japan and they grow cucumbers. Cucumbers again is a very exotic variety sorted by about nine variables by text, color, shape, and other kind of a categories. Makato was very happy visiting his parents. And during one of the conversation with his parents, he got to know that their income over the years from growing cucumbers have come down. And he got concerned. He spoke to his mom and she said, yes. Makato had done a bit of AI in his engineering days. And this is where he felt this is the best time to put this engineering to use case and maybe a bit of AI over there. He went back to his home, picked up his iPhone, clicked about 3000 odd pictures of the cucumber farm, went back at his home, downloaded a Raspberry Pi 3 processor, which is available on Amazon for $35. He also downloaded an open source tool called Google TensorFlow, which is freely available. Then he started making annotations and labeling just to identify what is the right of right labeling and annotation in terms of the right mix of algorithm he can derive by just extrapolating the auction prices versus the cucumber his parents were growing. Few attempts later, he reached about 30%. He was not fine. He reached about 70% after a few iteration. He said it's good to go. He told his parents what exact variety of cucumber they should be growing. 18 months down the line, his parents' income have went up by 400%. And the cost associated of using AI was just $35, which was the Raspberry Pi 3 processor. Now, coming back to the corporate side, the enterprise side, a lot has gone in the last couple of years in terms of this pandemic-led global business conundrum, I see. Innovation, transformation, optimization at scale 
has become a reality. Then if that's not enough, CEOs are facing unprecedented challenges. For the first time ever during pandemic, the challenges around cybersecurity threats, growing customer expectation, also in terms of finding capital and keeping themselves solvent has never been seen before. If that's not enough, we are talking about an era which is where what we call data deluge. I mean, this is how the paraphrasing go up. I am data rich, information poor, inside staff can help solve my problem. Now, one zettabyte of data, the world will produce 44 zettabyte of data last year, and the world will also produce 185 zettabytes of data by 2025. What's one zettabyte of data? Just to give you an idea, one zettabyte of data is equivalent to all the video titles of Netflix put together, multiplied by 317 million times. And if that's not enough, we're also talking about a social data, digital data, the kind of uploads, downloads we are trying to do on a daily basis, real-time basis across YouTube, Insta, I mean, Facebook, that's unprecedented. Now think of a scenario where organizations are sitting on a proprietary data. Can they afford even also to miss proprietary or digital data? And the answer is no. A lot of studies, surveys have shown that there is a direct correlation in terms of artificial intelligence getting enabled and reducing the decision-making latency in the organization. And the fact over there is that decision-making is now directly linked in the corporate with AI. What are the new pillars of enterprise strategy we are talking about? And this is all emerged in terms of what I call the new normal. One, there is a lot of reimagining the customer experience. Customer wants bespoke individual experience, which is compelling organizations to start innovating product and services. And transformation of the business is nothing but ripping apart the value chain of the businesses and replacing that with the new value chain. Look at what FinTech has done for banking, InsurTech for insurance. And this is where we say just getting the data itself is not enough. Algorithms is where the real value resides. Algorithms are defining intelligence, insights, and recommendation for the end stakeholders and the enterprises. And algorithms are also becoming the secret source and key differentiators and competitive advantage for the organization. Now look at some of these new age firms, Google, Facebook, Amazon, Airbnb, Netflix, Pandora. I mean, some of, for some of you, these are digital firms, new age firms, exponential technologies led firm. I call these firms as math houses. So much of algorithms, so much of crunching of data has gone into making these organizations very smart, very, very powerful. And this is where we say, we are talking about an emergence of algorithmic economy. The democratization of analytics and AI and data as a service will lead to creation of what we call a virtual exchange. Now, this virtual exchange is just akin to a stock exchange. Think of this, you got a problem in your office, a supply chain problem, a marketing problem, a sales problem. You're not able to find a solution. You go to this virtual exchange, which has tons of algorithms created by niche boutique large firms. You have a marketing optimization problem. You go into this particular exchange, punch in your user ID password. What you get to know immediately are tons of marketing optimization algorithms. You try to do a POC, a quick demo, you like it, you buy it, and turn that particular algorithm in your premise in your office. It works well. You buy new versions of that. Now, this is where millions of algorithms in the time to come will start creating magic for the organizations. And what it will do is to kind of ensure that the decision makings are being done in the organizations or personal side on a real-time basis by algorithms. And this is where we're talking about even algorithms occupying the boardroom seats. And that's a reality today, which is happening. There is also an analytical paradox what we say. And this is best summed up in a way that those who make the fewest decisions have the most information, and those with the most decisions have the least information. And that's true, very, very true in the corporate scenario. And this is where the whole aspect of what we are saying today, while many of the decisions of what we are doing on a strategic, tactical, operational basis are based on algorithms, 
what's happening today, five to 10 years from now, majority of the decisions, significant proportion of decisions will be taken by governments. If that something starts happening, think of this, how AI will try decision-making at scale and problems will be actually addressed by AI. What, for that to happen, there is something called what we call augmented intelligence, automate and learn, and incorporating human behavior, which comes in. Let me take one by one what I'm talking about. Augmenting intelligence is all about what we call, how do you start looking at data from on non-obvious sources? Think of this particular example. It's not about a Facebook example. It's about any public listed company having an earnings call. Every three months, they need to have an earnings call where they need to show results. I've never come across a CEO who's not bullish about the company while giving a narrative about the financials. But the fact there is a lot of money at stake. What can happen in that situation is a lot of hedge funds, stakeholders, shareholders, people who have put in money cannot rely just on the financial commentary. So what comes in is computer vision, a lot of AI where speech recognition, computer vision analyzing the facial expressions are being mapped. Any lump in the throat, any kind of a softness in the voice could be construed that things are not right along with if there are any expressions which are not in sync with the buoyancy of the voice could be construed, things are not dry. Moving on in terms of a visual, visual image of a satellite imagery camera, you can see there are cars in the parking lot. Now, a retailer does not here wants to estimate the footfalls. They're trying to analyze the make of the car, the model of the car, the total time the cars have been parked in the parking lot and extrapolating that with the number of stores and with the same data to see what could be their financial earnings three months, six months, nine months from now. Let's look at other example. Basement, basement, basement. Let's go, huh? let's go. Over here, over here. No, come on, come on, come on. It's all right. Good shot. Good shot. Now, this is a 20 second clip of a US soccer match. 82% of the US population watch this particular match. $160 billion of ad spend happens in the single match. One TV commercial costs about $3.5 to $4 million. So a lot of money at stake. So what's happening when you are advertising on the brand? Can you afford not to see your brand visible? So what's happening? A lot of computer vision analysis in terms of how marketing and date decisions is being analyzed. Look at the same kind of a video uh, clip now with a different version where a lot of labeling and annotation has happened as compared to what was done in the case of Cucumber also and how the brands are reflecting when there are jersey of the player, turf of the stadium, players gallery in a split. Basement, basement, basement. Let's go, huh? let's go. Over here, over here. No, come on, come on, come on. It's all right. Good shot. Oh, no. This is how the brands are taking decisions on a very instant basis using a lot of AI over there. Moving on, this is an example about AI for humanity. I mean, this is where it's a real life story where we say things come alive and becomes magic. This is a story about Saqib Sheikh. Saqib Sheikh is born and bred up in Pakistan. He's visually impaired from the birth he cannot see, but he's brilliant in studies. He did his engineering, moved to US. He got a job in Microsoft. After a few months of a job in Microsoft, during one of the coffee conversation with his colleagues, his colleagues at Microsoft said, Saqib, let's make your life magical. Now, one thing about Saqib, which I did not share with you, he's visually impaired. He's blind from the birth. He cannot see. Sakib got miffed. He said, guys, there's nothing magical in my life. I cannot see. Please do not joke around with me. 
After a few months, they gave Sakib a pair of glasses. You can see what he's wearing out here in the picture. Now, these are not ordinary pair of glasses. The glasses have innate ability to click pictures on the go. Your first reaction would be, what's the meaning of pictures for a blind man? You're right. The pictures are getting translated into voice. And this is what Sakib is able to hear on a real-time basis when he's pressing on a left index finger with his stem on the glasses. Sakib, 10 to 15 meters ahead of you, there is probably a 15 to 16-year-old kid wearing a navy blue jersey, beige trouser, black sneakers on a skateboard. Would you like to meet? Imagine the life of Sakib turning magical with AI. On an automation side, a lot of things have been sent about displacement. It's about the human-machine alignment, as I say. 7,000 deaths happen in the US because of wrong prescription of medicine and drug. Because doctor's handwriting, with all due respect, is illegible in many parts of the globe. You cannot comprehend sometimes, and even the chemist or the pharmacist cannot make what's there. That results into wrong prescription, wrong medicines being given across the counter, deaths happen. A sophisticated arm, laced with a lot of algorithmic technique, is being deployed in US in many of the stores. You visit this particular store. It's there in California, San Francisco. She'll take the prescription. She'll scan the prescription. The algorithm will start working. In US, as the patient data records are linked, she'll go through the store, picks up the relevant medicine, come back to the store on the front desk, give you the medicine. You can pay by a contactless credit card, move out of the store in flat 50 to 60 seconds. And 99% is the accuracy rate what we're talking about. Now, this particular image you will see, maybe it's like a Matrix movie. No, it's an HR case study. What's happening out here, a lot of sophisticated cameras are being deployed in an e-commerce retailer where they're trying to understand the fatigue level of the employees. This is not about any kind of infringement or security which the operation teams are doing. HR managers are sitting, looking at the fatigue levels which is what you can make out through the facial expression. And at some point of time, given it's a 24 by seven, high octane kind of a, let's say, environment, if the fatigue is high, they just go on the floor, pause the production, give a pat on the back award. Imagine a scenario where most of the spot awards, pat on the back awards are being given on a ad hoc basis. This gets changed in terms of HR taking faster decision-making. Something which we've always missed about what I call where rules and regulations don't work, nudges happen. AI alone will not solve the problem. It's not about just looking at the small or the significant ones. It's also about how the adoption will happen. Look at this particular toothbrush. I mean, toothbrush today are coming with, fitted with sensors, not a big deal, but what's happening when you take this toothbrush, which is what it'll be, you download an app. The app actually starts working the minute the kid or the adult starts toothbrushing. I mean, the whole thing over there is an idle toothbrushing time is two minutes. Anything less than that, the emoji turns kind of in a screeching voice and it gives a very kind of a frowning look. And today we know that a lot of our life depends on emoticons and emojis. You see the whole emoji, you don't feel happy, you brush it again, more than two minutes, you can see the contours, it's fine. I mean, there is a happy jingle, you go back and start working. And that's where how analytics and also what we call human behavior nudges starts working across. Now, this particular ice cream manufacturer start doing everything to increase the scale. Nothing happened in terms of increasing the quantum of sale. They started giving loyalty coupons, discounts, analytics, nothing happened. They deployed an AI professional with a cognitive neuroscience person. And this is what happened. jingle was played in that particular part of the store where ice creams were kept. Think of our life in our formative years where we have seen how a jingle gets kind of in a compelling mode for us when an ice cream kiosk person comes in and gives me, I would say, ice cream. And that's where people were drawn. And within a quarter, 15% of the sales uplift happened by just playing this particular jingle. Let's look at this particular video clip.
as we say, eventually AI alone is not enough. If the art of decision making needs to be enjoyed on a personal level or at a corporate level, it's an amalgamation or what I call a trifecta of AI, engineering, and design. And this is what will actually sift out in terms of how significant, trivial, or kind of a, let's say, large decision we take. Thank you so much. Thank you, Mr. Samir, for your speech. Next up, we have Mr. Dhawal Jain. Mr. Jain is an IS officer and has been awarded the President's Gold Medal for his outstanding public administration contribution. His stellar contributions have led to him being invited to present his work to the President and the Prime Minister of India. Before joining the Indian Administrative Services, he completed his MBA from IIM Ahmedabad and has worked for Accenture Management Consulting and Citibank in Hong Kong. He was also selected by the US government to represent India amongst 24 countries in their most prestigious exchange program, the International Visitors Leadership Program or the IVLP. He is currently serving as the Municipal Commissioner of Howrah, West Bengal. And today, he'll be talking about how to identify the minuscule things which bring the monumental changes. Now I invite you to deliver your talk. Thank you, Mehul, for that very, uh, very, very generous introduction. Uh, good evening, everyone. I would like to stick to the overall umbrella of the theme, which is minuscule yet monumental. But I plan to talk about the little things that matter in policy making. So to begin with, let's hear this very beautiful song from Basu Chatterjee's movie Choti Si Baat. Now, in this uh, song, basically, Vidya Sinha, who is the male lead, is expressing that she's not able to understand why when Amol Palikar is away, it is these little things about him which she misses the most. So do you really think these minuscule things, when we are all busy with such big things in life, we are worried about these big things in life, do you really think these minuscule things lead to monumental results? Now, let us delve a little deeper to understand this. You see this chocolate pastry? Do you feel weak in your knees seeing it? Yes, I do, because we all have a sweet tooth. We are attracted towards sugar. Why do you think it is? It is because our ancestors were pretty low in the food value chain. We got food left over or rejected by elephants, lions. So getting fruits which were sweet was almost next to him. Now this transmitted in our genes. Over generations, we have craved for sugar because we never got it enough earlier. Now one day, this misery got resolved. By chance, man stumbled upon a spark of fire by rubbing two stones or stick. Now, this minuscule spark led to the discovery of fire. And you know, every animal fears fire. Human being immediately sat on the top of this value chain. And now we leave food and other animals eat it. Such a minuscule spark of fire and a monumental change in our life. Now, your immediate question to me would be, that do all mon minuscule things lead to monumental changes? And the answer to that lies in what I call the biryani theory. Now, in a biryani, if you realize that the secret element to the taste is actually the low flame cooking. The flame intensity decides how well the interaction is taking place between the ingredients and what kind of transformation is taking place. You eventually get a resultant product, which is far more than the sum of its parts which is the ingredients, the boiled rice, the meat, the spices. It is this flame which is bringing the right interaction. So not all components in a system or in a decision-making process are that valuable. They, are, they don't really matter. Only the ones which create the right interactions 
the ones which create these right interactions lead to the right transformations and these are the components which i feel are the most important now if we apply this to a decision making process this decision making process can be a organizational strategy it can be public policy making but if you see a decision making process it looks somewhat like different stages of a system as you see on the screen it's basic schematic it has an input part it has a process level which is processing some feedback loop there is a point of application where you applying the input or the feedback and then there is a result there is an output now these components which we talked about the ones which are bringing the transformation can actually be at any of these stages input process feedback so what i'll do is i'll go with you through each of these stages we'll take a example from say industry and then i'll talk about my personal experiences in policy implementation so let's start with input and i'll li like to see this clip from alibaba the story of which we which we really like from a child and went back to the cave when he came in front of the cave he repeated the words he learned from alibaba open sesame open the big rock suddenly started to move and the gate to the cave open open sesame open or khul ja sim sim this is the only input which will open the way to treasure so not all inputs work so there are some inputs which lead to monumental results example you must have seen the plants at your home if you add egg shells or white vinegar you will see a monumental growth this is only obtained from these two inputs not any general input when we applied this theory in our municipal corporation to anganwadi centers we realized the same that if we provide at these centers nutritional supplements fortified food to antenatal mothers expecting mothers we will get newborns which are fit they are not stunted they are not wasted this input minute nutrition leads to a monumental result for the growth of our economy because now we get a workforce which is fit which is effective so a monumental result for us now slight process changes can also impact like say for example the movie karate kid i have grown up seeing this movie again and again let's see a clip show me wax on wax off that's 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 Show me pen to fence. Hey! Hey! Yes! Now Mr. Miyagi teaches Daniel karate in a very different way. Not the regular way. He makes him wax his car, paint his fence. Now Daniel is very angry that he's not learned anything. The tournament is right around the corner. But Miyagi shows him that how he has learned karate. He pushes a few punches at him and he asks him to move his hand as if he's painting the fence or waxing his car. And he realizes that he's learned a slight change in the process by mr miyagi and a monumentally quick and precise learning by daniel say for example henry ford before he came up with his assembly line the car spare parts were actually made separately they were not made to scale so all these parts had to be brought in together chiseled in fitted in it took in a lot of time and effort now mass production the key to it is not what people then and now believe the moving assembly line is actually the interchangeability of parts ford decided that every part has to be made to scale there was a gauging system now there is no need to fit them in together chisel them in together there is a moving assembly line a worker waits there steadily monumental reduction in manufacturing time for a car from 514 minutes to 2.3 minutes such a minuscule change in process monumental reduction in time now we applied this concept in the municipal corporation to basically issue faster trade license it used to take days brokers used to disturb middlemen used to disturb disturb people there was a nexus a minuscule change in the process which we bought was self certification self declaration and real time generation of online licenses now it was as if you are booking tickets on a airline website you put in the destination you make the payment and you can print out the ticket or the license immediately you, there was no inspection done there were no hard copies required you didn't need to visit the office people warned us that our revenue will fall people will lie in these self declaration forms but our revenue in the last 3 months have grown by 200% minute change in process simplification now those of you who would not have seen karate kid to understand feedback how it impacts the result Let's see this beautiful scene from Friends. Yes. Here we go. Pivot. 
Pivot! 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 Shut up! Shut up! Shut up! Now, this is an iconic scene. Ross deciding that he'll not pay for the delivery cost of the couch, carry it himself from the shop to home. Now, the friends were there with him at the shop, but none of them gave him the feedback that it will be a very difficult task. Now, a minute feedback then could have had a monumental change in the result, but I would have missed out on this very, very funny scene. So, if we apply this as an example, you see rewards and recognition in most organizations these days is based on this feedback. So, you give the right feedback, creates the right enforcement, a positive reinforcement to the employee, the right contribution from the employee gets the best results. We also tried this in the municipal corporation I'm working in. We tried social audit. Instead of deciding ourselves, we asked people which roads we should make. Once the work was started, the quality of work was monitored by these people. Unique solutions came in. This would not have been possible if me or my engineers would have decided. So this social audit brought in a monumental change in our service delivery, a minute feedback. The point of application of input or feedback can also, also change the entire dynamics. Let's see this clip from Scam 1992. I think this was the only savior in the entire COVID lockdown. I don't give a tip in the market, but because today the market is open, I give a tip in the market. Invest in India. Put it in India. Because India is going to grow. Harshad Mehta is trying to say that right time to invest in the markets is now. The time of your investment. The point of application will decide if the returns will be monumental or not. You remember the physics class, there's this concept of lever. Now, the right point of application of the force and the position of the fulcrum will actually change the entire game. A human being can move a rock as big as this with a stick. If the point of application of the force is right. Now, in policy making, we found that we can apply this to stop early girl child marriage. Early marriage leads to early pregnancy. This leads to health hazards for the mother and the child. We tried providing a lot of income support to people, but they used to divert it for their consumption. Marriages were going on early. Kanya Shri, which has got a UN, UN award now, we started giving in stipends monthly to girls. And a lump sum 25,000 rupees was paid on her 18th birthday if she remains unmarried. Now, it was very difficult to now divert this. Because it, the point of application of the subsidy or the income support was attached to the girls. There was, it was conditional on, it, on her marriage. A monumental result was obtained. Average age of marriage in most districts increased by two to three years. So a minute change in point of application, monumental results. Now, output is very interesting. Output is already given to you. It comes out of a system. But minute evaluation of the output can also change how we decide the output is, it can lead to a monumental result. Let's see this. Mere prashn ka uttar do, Dharam Raj, mere prashn ka uttar do. Ashatama hatayiti. Pandavas are not able to defeat Dronacharya who's fighting from the side of Korvas. So they go to him and tell him that your son Ashwatthama is dead. They had actually killed an elephant named Ashwatthama. Now, Dronacharya, worried, comes to Yudhishthira to confirm this. And Yudhishthira, you all know, never lies. Yudhishthira loudly declares, Ashwatthama is dead. But he softly murmurs, it was actually an elephant. So, Dronacharya breaks down. A minute misevaluation on the part of Dronacharya costed him a monumental fall. Now, if we apply this, this ad, Mutual fund sahi hai, you must have seen this. It is made by Amphi, which is basically composed of different mutual fund houses like HDFC, Kota, Kai. They invest to attract customers to their industry. Now, say for example, ICICI is investing money in this advertisement, but the customer gets attracted to mutual fund industry, but goes to HDFC. So ICICI a marketing manager would think that my entire investment has gone waste. The customer didn't come to me. But actually, if you see closely, the customer otherwise who would have invested in gold or real estate has been brought to this mutual fund industry. The pie of the market has grown. 
So now it will be easier in the future, cheaper in the future to attract this customer from HDFC to, I, to ICICI. So a minuscule change in interpretation of the output leads to a monumental change in our strategy. I was also surprised when I actually attended the first Panchayat meeting and I saw the Pradhan Pati sitting behind, beside the Pradhan. It was the husband of the Pradhan. I was shocked. He was taking most of our calls. Now, one might immediately feel that this policy of reservation in, for a post of Pradhan, where we have reservation for women or backward classes, has failed. But if you look closely, you will realize that there is so much of impact this has had on the minds of people when they see a lady sitting at the head of the such table of such important meetings. The mindset has changed. Slowly, she participates and inspires generations of girls. This would not have been possible without this policy. A minuscule change in way we look at the result decides whether the policy was a success or a failure. Now, after this entire discussion, you would ask me that I am confused as a policy maker. I am confused as a strategy maker. What should I focus on? Should I focus on the big picture? Or should I focus on these granular things? I would say they don't contradict each other. They complement each other. Say, for example, you are a pilot. You want to fly. micro decision of what height you should fly at doesn't really interfere. Rather, it complements your decision to fly from Delhi to Kolkata. How? Because if you fly at a height where the air resistance is less, your flying time will be less. So your micro decision of the height is complementing the macro decision of flying from Delhi to Kolkata. So what is the key takeaway we have from the entire discussion? It is the three eyes. You, in, you isolate, you break down the entire decision-making process into input, process, feedback, output. Then you remember you the biryani theory, you identify. You identify the components which are leading to the right interactions and transformations for you. And then you invest. You invest only in these components. You withdraw from everywhere else and you invest in these components. This investment can be funding, it can be training, it can be skilling, it can be engaging. You remember the clip we saw in the beginning? The movie Choti Si Baat, Ashok Kumar actually in the movie uses three eyes. He is a personality coach. He isolates and identifies the things which might impress Vidya Sina. And then skills Amol Palikar only on these. And rest we all know is history. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Dhawal, for your speech. Now, let's hear it from Mr. Mihir Bose. Mr. Bose is an award-winning journalist and author. He writes and broadcasts on social and historical issues and sports for a range of outlets, including the BBC, Financial Times, Evening Standard, and Irish Times. Mr. Bose has written more than 30 books and was BBC's first sports editor the first non-white to become a BBC editor. He moved to BBC after 12 years at the Daily Telegraph. He has contributed to nearly all major UK newspapers and presented programs on radio and television. And he will be speaking about significance of little things in life. So we now invite you to deliver your talk. Thank you. Good evening and greeting from a rather dismal grey London. I'm speaking to you from uh, on Zoom from my loft in Shepherd's Bush. Um, it would have been nice to be there in person, but we know how COVID has uh, changed our world. Now, the theme of this talk um, is how little things matter. Um, and I'm so glad it is because we all know little things matter, yet we pay so little attention to them. Um, little thing always reminds me of a story my wife has always told me. She first told me when um, we were getting married. This is uh, about um, a husband and wife who just got married. And the husband says, my wife looks after the little things. She looks after how we can get money to buy a house, a mortgage, how we're going to educate our children, um, how we shall deal with our household, make sure we have a very fulfilled life. I manage the big things like what should be the interest rate, um, whether taxation should be increased, uh, uh, whether we should spend more money on the environment, uh, how fast the economy is growing, that sort of thing. Now, 
at this stage, I don't know if you're laughing, you're supposed to fall about laughing. The, the reason is that the little things that the wife handles is actually the big things for the couple. And the big things that the husband says he's going to handle is beyond his competence, is beyond his pay grade. He's not the governor of the bank to decide what the interest rate is. He's not the chancellor of the exchequer or the finance minister to decide what the taxation will be or what the GDP will be and things like that. Yet, yet it is the little things in life that the wife, he says, is in control of that um, uh, is, is really important. Now, I think we, we sometimes forget about these little things. We ignore them. We, we think they are not important. We don't pay much attention to them. For instance, take this very little thing of being polite to people. Now, I've lived in Britain for half a century. And one of the first things I learned when I came to this country is how important two words are, please and thank you. You've always got to say that. There's another important word that the British use, sorry. They're always saying sorry, even if they don't always mean that they're sorry. But nevertheless, let's, let's look at please and thank you. So for instance, if somebody asks you whether you want a cup of coffee um, and you say, Yes, you're supposed to say yes, please, not just yes, because if you just say yes, they'll correct you and say yes, please. Or if somebody says you want a cup of coffee and you say no, you can't just say no, you've got to say no, thank you. Otherwise, they'll get upset. Now, when I came to this country in 1969, which was a long time ago, I didn't know all this because in India, we don't tend to say that. I don't know whether India has changed now and whether you in, in uh, Bangalore, by the way, why do you call it Bangalore? It should be Bangalore. But anyway, I used to call it Bangalore when I first went there all those years ago. But um, the point is, um, I wasn't brought up in that. Although I grew up in Mumbai and I consider Mumbai my hometown and I can speak Marathi. I used to come first in Marathi in, in school, may I say. Um, I am from Bengal. My parents are from what is now Bangladesh and, and they considered Calcutta their home. I never did. And so I speak Bengali. And of course, in Bengali, the thank you word is dhonnabad, but you'll find very few people saying dhonnabad if you ask them um, uh, whether they want a cup of tea or coffee. In fact, it's a bit of a joke term. And um, in India, it was very common for me growing up to find the shopkeeper in any shop um, that I'd gone. If they were going to give me change, they would bounce the change in front of me. If I did that in this country, I tell you, I, I would be in, in, in a lot of trouble. Yet, and there is another little thing in India, which is so different to little things here. And let me tell you a story about my family. This goes back to 1953. It shows how old I am. Um, and uh, we were having a family photograph. And in those days, this is long before um, uh, iPhones and, uh, you know, selfies that you could take and things like that. You went to a studio. So my parents and my father had arranged for us to go to a studio. However, the day we were supposed to go to the studio, a friend of my father's, and we had been a guest of his at, at his uh, place in Mathuran, which is a hill station near Mumbai, um, K arrived. And my father thought he couldn't not ask him to come along. So that's the only photograph I have of my family. My mother, my father, my two sisters and me also has a photograph of this man standing behind. And now I have this photograph in my hall in, 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 the, in the house in Shepherd's Bush that um, I have, that I share with my wife. And um, my English friends come and look at it and I very proudly display the photograph. And I say, this is, this is from my childhood. It shows me wearing a tie and you know properly dressed up and so on and so forth. My sisters are in frocks, my father in a suit, my mother in a sari and all that. And they look at it and they admire it. And then they say, uh, talk with the man behind and they say, oh, um, he, he must have been your uncle. And when I tell them, no, he was a certain Mr. Das, who was a family friend who happened to be there that day. And out of good manners, one of those little things, my father thought he could not be, not be part of the photograph. Um, they are absolutely amazed because that is something you just wouldn't do in this country. It, it, it is impossible. Now, for instance, and I'll let me give you another example of, of a little thing that Indians do, which I find very, very touching. Now, the, the technical man who's organizing this talk, you probably don't know, is a man called Shardul Gag, who's been in touch with me, wonderful man. And he's addressed me as sir. And nobody in this country, and I've lived here for 50 years, would ever address me as sir. They
they would think it demeaning for themselves to call me sir. But he addresses me as sir as a mark of respect. You know, I suppose he, he, he thinks I'm old enough to be a sir. And when I was growing up in India, I always touched the feet of people who came to our house. I was encouraged, in fact, obligated. It was mandatory to call them uncle or aunt, depending on whether they were male or female, and to touch their feet. Now, in this country, when I tell my English friends that, they are absolutely appalled. Absolutely. For them, that, that what for me, when I was growing up, was a very simple gesture, which meant a lot, which meant respect, which meant that I, I was showing the right um, amount of um, courtesy and kindness to friends of my parents uh, would here be completely um, demeaning and totally unacceptable. But I suppose the best examples of little things that I can provide is from the great men who helped India win freedom. Let's take Mahatma Gandhi, father of the nation. Now let me go back to 1931. India is in the middle of trying to get freedom from Britain. Britain doesn't want to give India freedom, doesn't, doesn't believe the Indians can, can rule themselves. The Gandhi and the Congress Party have decided that if, they, if the British don't give at least dominion status, which is what they had given to their white colonies like Australia, Canada, New Zealand and South Africa, um, the whites were believed to be the only people who could, who could manage their own affairs, uh, then Gandhi would launch a civil disobedience campaign. Now, Gandhi does one thing. He writes a letter to the Viceroy. This is what he always did. Before he started any campaign, he would write a letter to the Viceroy saying, if you do this, I won't start the campaign. But if you don't, I'll start the campaign. And you know what the letter said? The letter did not have a single word about freedom, about dominion status, about the British leaving India, nothing like that. The letter said, remove the tax on salt, have prohibition, and you know, there was Shubhash Bose, a great freedom fighter who wanted the British out of India, who eventually, as we know, left India to raise an army uh, to fight the British during the Second World War. He was appalled. He said, what is this letter that Gandhiji has written? Where is the talk of that if you freely make salt, they would understand the iniquity of foreign rule? And he followed this up with another, what looks like a very, very simple step. He said, I'm going to go to the seashore from my ashram in, in, in near Ahmedabad, Sabarmati, and I'm going to make salt. But he didn't just get into a car or a train and go there. He walked. And remember, this is long before anybody thought of 24-hour television, let alone Twitter, Instagram, uh, Facebook or anything. And as he walked, he made the people of the world aware, till newsreel cameras came along, aware of what India was going through. And then he went to the beach near Dandi, and I've been there. It's a very moving place. And he picked up uh, 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 some uh, sand from the sea and so on and made salt. And that gesture started what was the most decisive civil disobedience campaign um, in, in the history of the freedom movement. And he um, recognized how this thing can work. Or let's take another little step that he took. One of the first things he did after he came back from South Africa was he discarded all his Western clothes and he wore a loincloth. And he wore the sort of dress that as Winston Churchill um, making um, fun of him said is what a fakir in India wears, a loincloth and a simple, uh, a, a simple um, uh, piece of um, dhoti around him. But in making that gesture, he was saying, I represent India. And it was in this dress that he went to see the Viceroy Lord Halifax climbing up the Viceregal Steps. The Viceregal Steps were the grand thing. Britain had built New Delhi, the place that would last them for a thousand years. So they thought their empire would last a thousand years. And here was this man representing real India, not the India of suits, and, and elaborate clothes, but the India that represented the masses. And that had an enormous impact, very little thing. And, you know, it's very interesting. Soon after that, he came to England um, uh, uh, and met the king, and he went in the same dress to meet the king. And he was asked by the British newspapers um, uh, and uh, that, you know, uh, aren't you underdressed? He said, the king dressed for me and for himself. The king was dressed 
in plus fours, I was dressed in minus fours. You know, Gandhi understood what simple gestures can mean, what the impact it can be on the world. So, for instance, when Gandhi met whoever he met, he met them sitting on the floor in his, in his ashram, wherever that was. And in 1942, Sir Stratford Cripps went to India to try and see if he could get the British Raj and, and, the, and the Congress Party together. They were at loggerheads because the British had, had declared war and had said nothing about giving India freedom. And when he went to meet Gandhi, he took his shoes off and sat down on the floor. And that gesture, simple gesture, if you, you might think, caused absolute horror in Britain. The, the king's... Um, private secretary wrote in his diary that this is terrible. How could he do that? It is so demeaning. And yet that gesture meant it had an enormous impact. It had created ripple waves of what, what India represented to that extent in, in the sense Gandhi was saying, I am a human being. I am the equal of you. If you come into my house wearing shoes and I require you to take off your shoes, you have to do that. And, and, and may I say, in Indian homes, both in India and in this country, people are required to take off shoes. A very simple thing, but people have to follow that. And these are, these are simple, simple gestures. It's very interesting. About a couple of years ago, uh, Prince William, who will one day become King uh, of England, and his wife, uh, the Duchess of Cambridge, went to Pakistan. It was very interesting that the Duchess of Cambridge um, had a headgear covering her head in the way um, Muslim women do. And that was actually praised in England compared to what had happened to Stafford Cripps when he, when he met uh, Gandhi. That was praised as a sign that the Duchess, future Queen of England, understood Muslim feelings about how women should dress. And that is where the change has come. That is where, if you like, the importance of simple little things have made a huge impact. How you dress, how you address people, how you talk has enormous and in big impact. Let me give you another just um, uh, a little thing from history. Lord Mountbatten arrives in India uh, after the war. He's been told by Clement Attlee, the British Prime Minister, that we have to leave India. We can't hold on to India. And he meets Jawaharlal Nehru, uh, one of our great leaders, India's first prime minister. And you know one of the things he tells Nehru? Well, you know, you can always come and have a swim at the Viceregal Palace. And that was the first time anybody had made that gesture to Nehru, that he liked to have a swim. And the Viceregal Palace, um, which is now called Rastavadhi Bhavan, has a wonderful swimming pool. And that formed a bond between the two. And that is a sort of simple gestures that we often forget to make. We think of the big things and we forget what the, what the simple things are. And history is full of, let me say, simple things going wrong and, and, and being quite disastrous. And let me give you a story from, from the Indian past. This is the kingdom of Vijayanagar. Um, Vijayanagaram, the great historic kingdom, a great Hindu kingdom. And... Um, surrounded by Muslim uh, rulers uh, who wanted to destroy it, but the Muslim rulers themselves were fighting each other. And the, the kings and the rulers of Vijayanagar combined with one Muslim ruler to fight another one. And they had one of these battles. They won. At the end of it, after the victory, there was the victory banquet. But the then ruler of Vijayanagar did not attend the, the, the banquet. He didn't want to eat with the Muslims. And what happened? These Muslims are very offended. Very simple gesture after a battle. And um, they said, no, this man has to be removed. And all these Muslim um, uh, kingdoms which surrounded Vijayanagar, which had been fighting each other, combined and destroyed Vijayanagar again. Now, I'm not saying had this ruler gone and had um, uh, broken bread with, with, with his uh, Muslim allies, uh, that Vijayanagar wouldn't have been attacked by um, uh, an alliance of all the Muslim rulers. But what I'm saying is that gesture, that, that, that little thing did not uh, go down very well. And throughout history, you see that, that people make, you know, impulsively sometimes forget that the little things that they, that they do are, are um, uh, they forget what the, what the import 
of, of those little things are, how those little things add up. And our life is, 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 is filled with that. And of course, as, as we uh, become more technologically adept, as we become more technologically savvy, these little things have, have an enormous impact. I'm talking to you in a background um, uh, in England where there has been enormous publicity about racism in cricket started with Yorkshire cricket that those were the first allegations that were made and and it has gone on and you know many of these allegations are about simple little things of behavior of how people addressed each other without knowing what those words meant without knowing what those words signified at times I'm, I'm always hesitant to call people um, a racist out and out racist um, or institutional racism because that is a very big charge to me I think very often it is because people don't understand how sensitive other people can be about the way you address them, about the way you talk to them, about the way you you make them feel part of, 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 of their lives. And perhaps the, the biggest example of little things is the story of Yudhishthira at the end of Mahabharata. For me, Yudhishthira is the perfect human being. He's the greatest figure in mythology that I know of. And what's the story about Yudhishthira? Yudhishthira is walking and there's a dog. And um, he, he, he cares for this dog. And then there is a voice saying, you must discard this dog. And he refuses to discard the dog. And um, what happens? This dog turns out to be God. So, you know, there was this man who, who was prepared to give up heaven for a dog. But actually, it was a test that the gods had put on him. And, and now I'm not saying these, these gods put tests on us. But we, if we don't look at ourselves, and think of the other individual. How are we affecting them? How do we relate to them? Not in the big things of whether we are managing their lives, but in the little things of how we uh, um, uh, address them, how we talk to them, how we, how we, how we um, entertain them. Then at the end of it, I think our lives can be decisively and very, very damagingly affected. And that is, I think, the message of, of looking after little things right from the beginning of, um, you know, the, the wife looking after little things and managing the house and the husband thinking he can, he can manage interest rates to Gandhi writing to the Viceroy, not about freedom, but about making salt. A very simple thing. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Bose. Now let's call upon our last speaker for the day, Dr. Nupur Kohli. Dr. Kohli, a global speaker, an author, and is a strategic healthcare consultant. Fascinated by the human body and how it works, she obtained her master's degree in medicine in the Academic Medical Center, University of Amsterdam. Thereafter, she did Fundamentals of Business from the esteemed Harvard Business School, USA. She has participated in more than 100 talks and has been featured in several media appearances internationally. She has also won the TEDx Award 2012 in Delft. And today, she'll be speaking about the positive effect of micro habits on mental health. We now invite you to deliver your talk. I have here a piece of paper. This piece of paper is very big, but when we fold this very big paper in two halves and even another time and another time, this piece of paper becomes smaller. It becomes more manageable. Earlier, this piece of paper would not have fit within this wallet. But now, this piece of paper does fit within this wallet. And the same is with our habits. When they are very big, we cannot manage them and they might not fit. But when we make them smaller, our habits will fit. And that is what we want to accomplish. So let me first start with asking you a question. What are your daily habits? 
Today I want to talk to you about microhabits and the positive effect of microhabits on mental health. Everyone's mental health is a journey. We all go through good phases and less good phases in life. Every step on the way, we need to keep working on ourselves, no matter what happens. Our habits, and especially our microhabits, can play a big role there. Before we dive deeper into the microhabits and what they are, let me share two times with you that made me aware of how to handle a new habit, and also what effect a current habit can have on a person. Have you ever participated in a 21-day challenge to form a new habit? It is believed that it takes 21 days to form a new habit. But research shows it actually takes 66 days to form a new habit. And it takes until 254 days to fully make it automatic if you do the habit every day. Doing something new for 66 days a minimum is not an easy task. And this is also what I noticed even in a 21 day challenge to form a new habit. The new habit I had to form was a certain task that I had to do every day. The first few days I did the task as I was supposed to do. Then there came a moment that I missed doing the task for a day. It was a very busy day that day and I forgot to do the new habit. Anyone recognizes this? You want to form a new habit, but due to other things, you just forget to do it one day. I then started the next day again. Let's do this habit. A few days it went okay. Then one day I was in a rush and I only did a task that I wanted to make a new habit for half. Is there also anyone who recognizes this? You want to form a new habit, but one day you don't do the habit in full and you may end up not doing it at all. As you hear, dedicated commitment for many days in a row is not easy. Before I move on to what habits actually are, let me share my second example. This year I had injured my foot and it caused that I had to still the first weeks and could not do much. Because of this, I could only do the necessary things and a lot of things I had to leave. It also showed me what habits were essential to me, certain basic habits, and that many habits I now had to let go and not do anymore. Why is this useful in this talk today? To build new habits, know what are your essential habits and which habits you can maybe let go of. This way, there will be space for new habits. So know what habits are part of you, which ones you want to let go of and which new ones you want to learn. Knowing this will also help in a positive effect on your mental health. We all have certain habits every day. We brush our teeth, go to the toilet, take a shower. Basic habits. Maybe a next task is to make a to-do list for the day. This can be an easy task or a difficult one. We may procrastinate doing the task then. Why do we procrastinate? Often we procrastinate when we are afraid we might fail at a certain task we have to do. This task either feels too big or too difficult. The task can also be out of our interest. We perhaps find the task boring. Procrastination prevents us from building a new habit. Procrastination can also give negative feelings because we feel we are not progressing. It can make us feel busy, but we are not really accomplishing something. All this can bother our mind and have an effect on our mental health. It can make anxious, or give feelings of depression. Mental health is about our social, psychological, and emotional well-being. It has an effect on our behavior, our thinking, and on our feelings. So, when a task feels too big 
and we cannot build new habits that way. We have to make the task smaller, realistic, and in such a way that we accomplish it. It can feel like progress. We need microhabits. What is a microhabit? A microhabit is when you break down the new habits that you want to build in really small steps and start doing one of those really small steps. If you want to walk every day for 30 minutes, start with a jog in place of one minute, for example. Because a micro habit is so small, they are so powerful. If you did not have success with building a bigger habit, a micro habit can get you back on track. But be happy with the micro step. Be proud when you did a micro habit in a day Dreaming big is good, but it starts with the first and also small steps, especially when you find it difficult to build in a certain habit. Because the micro habit should require a minimum effort, this should also be easy to incorporate in your day. Our state of mental health has been a silent pandemic in the last few years. During COVID, 41% of Americans struggled with mental health, according to the BBC. Stress, anxiety, and exhaustion have increased. Instead of the big tasks, many are seeking for small happiness, small ways to improve. We need to take our health and mental health serious. We cannot recover right away. It takes time. We need to take micro steps. And even then, life will give you ups and downs. The micro steps may be more manageable. Poor mental health makes us lose enthusiasm to work and study and we lose productivity. During the pandemic, we felt loneliness and isolation. And when many work or study from home, the boundaries between work and private life may have become very thin. We can feel faster, overworked and stressed, which can even lead to burnout. Talking about our mental health and physical health is one step, but starting micro habits to improve our well-being can step-by-step step also lead to better mental health. To get to what micro habits work for you, it is important to ask yourself questions, but also to ask others questions. So, how to do this? For example, Take one minute to three minutes for every micro habit and start with a maximum of three micro habits a day. This means three to nine minutes of good habit building. We can do this. And set a timer when you do the habit. Think about why you want to do a certain micro habit. How will you get fun out of the micro habit? Maastricht University in the Netherlands reported that during the pandemic, Depressive complaints of students were 10.6% higher than before the pandemic, and that anxiety complaints were 5.3% higher. Clearly, it is time to take action. Now, think of what would be one thing that you can do in one to, two, to three minutes. And tomorrow morning, try this thing. When we do a micro habit in the morning, we still have energy to do it. We may not forget to do it, and then you can at least cross it off your to-do list and feel proud you did the micro habit. What are some of the best micro habits to do? Examples are jog one minute in place, laugh watching something funny, close your eyes for a minute, and not look at a screen. Write down three things you are grateful for. You can also do a one minute breathing exercise in the morning. Just breathe in and out and this will help you keep calm during the day. Later in the day, go out for one to three minutes. Look at the sky and nature and draw energy from nature. If you have more time, then go for a short walk, but make this a micro start or go on bicycle for a few minutes. Keep it all small and manageable. The challenge is to do it and make it a habit, no matter how small these habits are. 
So count to three and just do it. Still feels too difficult? Make the task even smaller or start with doing something you really like. In the evening, you could even take out one minute for a good read from a book or write for one minute about your day. Again, keep it short. The length is not important, but the habit. Are you satisfied with what you reached in a day? Is it okay if it not always will go right? Ask yourself such questions and the answers will help you together with the micro habits. Explore yourself. When you manage to incorporate micro habits for your well-being, you may feel more happy, but after a time also more healthy and with more energy. Our tendency is to think big. We think often of big exercises of half an hour to an hour or so, a duration that we often actually can do and leave it all together. Here comes the importance of a micro habit of doing it just for one to three minutes. Warren Buffett said the following on habits. Just do it. First you make your habits, then your habits make you. Which means that your habits will also form you to become a better person. But what other reasons make micro habits so important? Because they are easy and small, it should prevent you from not making excuses anymore to not do it. When you want to get rid of a bad habit, it may feel big. Good micro habits are great to tackle bad habits. And micro habits when using for physical health can reduce in the long run problems such as hypertension or diabetes or becoming overweight. And scientifically, it has been shown that when you write down three things that you are grateful for in the morning, the hormone serotonin is released, also called the feel-good hormone. But then you should really feel the appreciation and happiness when doing the micro habit. How do we stay motivated? By rewarding ourselves for being consistent building the habit. Take a nice bath to add a feel-good factor or have your healthy favorite food. Maybe once in a while celebrate with a small gift for yourself. This way we can find small moments of joy throughout the day, building micro habits. We live in a society where we are often expected to achieve high but these moments are for yourself. And do you feel that you mastered a micro habit? You can then go to the next step. According to Harvard Business Review, you can increase your micro habit by 10%, a ridiculously small amount. You're jogging in place for one minute? Make that one minute and six seconds. Feel you are actually ready for more, you can increase it, but make sure that you can maintain the habit. So, I said that this will have a positive effect on your mental health because it gives you small amounts of joy. But what is good mental health? It is not the absence of any mental health problems, but really the way you deal with it. Also with the use of micro habits. It means the ability to feel positive and negative emotions, that you can express these and can also talk about them, that we feel we are able to manage them. It also means that we can maintain a good relationship with others because being able to talk about ourselves and having a support system is important. And it also means that we can deal with changes that are happening, that we can adapt, that we can deal with uncertainty. It is not an easy task, but with small steps, we can get there. Especially in times of a pandemic and later recovering from it, it will be a continuous journey. So ask yourself today, what is so small that can give me a feeling of joy? Try it, do it, and share it. The start 
is the most important. Thank you, Dr. Kohli. With this, we come to the end of our speaker's lineup. Now we request our TEDx organizers, Aditi Joshi and Mehul Agarwal to address the audience. Good evening, everyone. I am Mehul Agarwal. We hope each and every person present here enjoyed the ninth edition of TEDx and MMS Bangalore. The event was curated by our team with a little love, a little passion, a few sleepless nights and a ton of fun. TEDx is an opportunity to bring the local community together to discuss ideas worth spreading and to be a part of this community is a matter of utmost pride for all of us. The goal of our event was to bring out the small things that built an empire. This was a small effort to help ignite great ideas in your minds through our speakers. It has been a fantastic evening and some good things have been achieved. We would like to start by thanking the college, our director, Dr. Rajendra Narkonkar, and all our respected faculty members and administration staff for giving us this opportunity of organizing one of the biggest flagship events of our college. A special thanks to our mentor, Professor Krishna Dhurpa sir, for guiding and encouraging us. Sir, we are grateful for your valuable insights and guidance throughout the process. Right from applying for the TEDx license to conducting the actual event flawlessly today, the past few months spent in curating the event have been nothing short of rewarding. Working with the dream team consisting of our senior and junior PSL members was a, was a wholesome and an amazing learning experience for me and Parithi. I would like to thank all our esteemed speakers for accepting our invitation and making this event a big success. Thank you for taking out your valuable time to grace our event with your presence today. It was a pleasure having you. Over to you, Parit. Thank you. Hi, I am Pariti Hoshi, and we'd further extend a warm partners for collaborating with us and making this event possible. We would like to thank the entire senior PR team, the OBs, Vartika, Tanvi, and Mansi, for being so supportive, cooperative, and helpful throughout. All the team members played a very essential role, right from finding the best partners for the event and promoting it with creative and engaging ideas to managing corporate relations, all within a very short span of time. Thank you so much for making my dream team a reality. Coming to the most hardworking lot of people that we are very proud to have as our junior PR team. Guys, this event would not have been possible without you. You put in your A game and worked as a great team, managing all the challenges effortlessly. We have spent so much time learning from each other as we try to bring the best suited people to share their ideas on our TEDx event today. Now, we, Mehul and I, both of us, proudly pass on the baton of our responsibility to all of you. I hope curating this event will be a special and memorable, as special and memorable for you as it is for both of us. So thank you once again for everything. Signing off. Thank you so much, Mehul and Paridhi. Now we request the public relations cell president, Vartika Jain to address the audience. Good evening, everyone. Uh, hope you all enjoyed the virtual TEDx experience today. The Public Relations Committee takes immense pride in organizing TEDx and MMS Bangalore for the ninth time. With TEDx, we have always aspired to broaden our horizons and gain new perspectives. And with this year's theme, we wanted to understand the necessity of the little things that make a huge impact. With the same little steps, our team has worked immensely hard over the past few months in approaching and creating a stellar lineup of speakers and getting amazing partners on board. I'd like to thank our respected director, Dr. Rajin Srinath Gunkar, and the Public Relations Committee uh, faculty mentor, Mr. Krishna Durbasar, for their constant guidance and support. Also to the TED organization for providing us with opportunity and platform to inspire the world. Starting with the two people who led the events preparation from the start, sat on long late night Zoom meetings and worked with sheer dedication to pull off such a great event. Mehul and Paridi, thank you so much. 
Aditi and Rehasha for highlighting Ter in the amazing, most amazing light possible with the branding campaigns. Tarun and Nishna for getting amazing partners on board. Simran and Anushka for managing corporate and media relations. Harsha for the aesthetically appealing creatives and trendy promotions. Naman and Yash for managing the budgets. And coming to the most talented and dedicated junior team anyone could have ever asked for. I'm very proud to say that this team will be leading the committee next year. Thank you so much, guys, for giving in your 100%. And we can clearly see an amazing output that you guys have pulled off such a great event today. And lastly, coming to the two most important people, my support system, without whom it would have been impossible to execute and manage anything, the VPs of PR committee, Tanvi Khanwala and Mansi Goel. Thank you so much for always having my back. Thank you so much to everyone who has joined in today. Your presence made this event a great success. Thank you to the respected speakers who spared their valuable time to share their thoughts and to the gifting partners, Leo Berry Gifts, Awestruck Designs, content partner, Tina Mahana and video partner, Yashna Bari. Thank you for your support. Thank you everyone. Over to our dynamic host now, Ritik and Kinjal. Thank you so much, Vartika. Before we bid you adieu, we'd like to tell you about our forthcoming event, Business Conclave, another flagship event of NMIMS Bangalore, which focuses on conversations and speeches by business subject experts. It's a one-stop shop for companies, industries, and seasoned professionals looking to engage in in-depth business discussions. Stay tuned to know more about Business Conclave. The event was supported by our gifting partners, Leo Berry Gifts, Ostrock Design Company, the video editing partner, Yashna Bahari, and the content partner, Tina Mahana. And with this, we come to the end. We would like to thank you all for joining us today. Hope you had a nice evening. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you guys, uh, amazing job guys. Thank you. Thank you team, thank you so much. Good show everyone, amazing. Thank you guys. Thank you guys, thank you. great event guys. Very well done, thank you so much. Everyone is requested to log off the meeting.